I want to talk to you about the future, but most people have an ambiguous attitude to the future. We have a mixture of fascination and fear. We'd like to know what's going to happen, and then we're not quite sure that we would like to know. Supposing I had a unique gift of knowledge, the word of knowledge, and could actually tell every one of you the date of your death, so that at the end of today I could stand at the door and shake hands with you as you leave and whisper in your ear the actual day you were going to die. Now, how many of you would like to know? Even if it was 50 years ahead, would you like to know? No, some of you, like me, wouldn't believe it if it was 50 years ahead. But you see, we've got this strange curiosity, we want to know what's going to happen, and then we're afraid to know. I mean, you could celebrate your death day as well as your birthday every year. <laughs> Wouldn't you like that? Or would you rather remain in ignorance? Would you like to know when the world is going to an end? Well, actually, scientists are now telling us a date when they believe the world as we know it will come to an end. I'll tell you the date later. But they could be wrong. So we have this strange ambiguity about the future. We want to know and we don't want to know. Now there are three ways of finding out about the future. The first I want to mention is the way of what I call superstitious divination, clairvoyance, horoscopes. Did you know that six out of ten men and seven out of ten women read their horoscope every day in this country? That's why no magazine or newspaper will come out without its star column. I'm happy to tell you I don't know which sign of the zodiac I was born under, and I'm not going to tell you my birthday because I don't want to know. I'd rather remain in ignorance. But people try to find out from the stars or from clairvoyance what their future is. Now, even the best clairvoyants like Jean Dixon, for example, who was one of the most famous in America, have never been more than 5% right in their predictions. Or to put it negatively, they've all been at least 95% wrong. So why do people go to them and why do people read their stars? The second way of finding out about the future is a little more accurate. I call that the way of scientific deduction. There are now professors of futurology in many universities and what they do, they extrapolate from the present trends into the future and try and work out and guess as reasonably accurately as they can what's going to happen. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology in America is one of the foremost bodies that is doing this work and they have come up with a date for the end of the world and the date is 2050. Given, they say, the present population growth and the energy resources and the food resources of our planet, that's the crossover point beyond which life will be impossible unless we can change some of the present trends, unless we can limit population growth or find new sources of energy. So 2050, we've got less than 60 years left, according to them. And incidentally, Guildford University came up with the same figure. So 2050 is a figure that's freely being talked about. Now scientific deduction about the future is about 25% accurate. Or to put it negatively, it's about 75% wrong. There is a third way of finding out the future that is even more accurate, and that is the way of scriptural declaration. So you can either go to superstition, or you can go to science, or you can go to scripture. Now, not many people realize that this book is packed with predictions about the future. Just about one verse in every four in the Bible contains a prediction about the future. And altogether, there are some 735 different events which are foretold within the pages of your Bible. 735. Now, how accurate has the Bible been so far? Well, it may be news to you that 600, sorry, 596 of those predictions have already come true to the letter. That's just over 80%. 
Now that doesn't mean that 80% of the Bible's predictions are accurate because most of the rest are concerned with the end of the world so they couldn't possibly have happened yet. In fact, there are less than 20 yet to happen before the return of Jesus to planet Earth. And so far the Bible has proved to be 100% accurate in its predictions about the future. So why do people go to superstition and to science when they could read about the future here and know that a book that has been right in 80% of its predictions is probably going to be right for the other 20%, especially about the events at the very end of history, the end of our world. Now out of all those events, out of the 735 predictions, there is one that occurs 318 times in the Bible. It is the most frequently mentioned prediction of all and that prediction is that Jesus Christ, who lived on earth 2,000 years ago, is coming back to planet earth. So that we're talking about the most predicted event in the Bible and we're talking about something that is absolutely certain to happen. Now there are many things we could say about this but we're going to ask a number of simple questions. First of all, where is he coming back? Secondly, how is he coming back? Thirdly, when is he coming back? Fourthly, very much more important, why is he coming back? There are plenty of Christians who believe he's coming back but who have never thought through why should he need to? Did he not do all that he needed to on the first visit? Why should he come back? And then the most practical question of all, how does that affect us? Let me ask you a question just to whet your appetite. Supposing Jesus is not coming back here at all. Supposing he is staying where he is in heaven and that we will go to join him there when we die and stay there with him forever and that a new heaven and a new earth will be created after that. Supposing he's not coming back here but we're all going to join him there and stay with him there, will that make any difference to the way you live next Monday morning? Now think it through. It's a good question to ask yourself. Well now let's go to that first question. Where is he coming back? And I want to say right at the beginning, he's not coming back to Ashford where we're recording this video. Nor is he coming back to England, nor to America, nor to Russia. He's not coming back to any of the world capitals. He's not coming back to any of the religious capitals. He's not coming back to Rome not coming back to Geneva or Canterbury, not coming back to New York, he's not coming back to Moscow, not coming back to Peking. So where is he coming back to? The answer to the Bible is quite clear, he's coming back to his own city, the city he called the city of the great king, Jerusalem. And that's where we'll need to be if we're going to meet him. That's the city he left from, that's the city he's coming back to. Now some people vaguely think he's coming back everywhere. I'm not quite sure that they've thought out how he can do that, especially since he's coming back in a body, with his body. And a body locates us in one place and you can't be in two places at once when you're in a body. And so Jesus is coming back with his body. One tradition says that that body was five feet ten inches tall. I don't know if that's accurate but I, I, I mention it just so that you realize it's real, he's coming back in his Jewish body and therefore he's got to come back to one place, can't come back everywhere at once which means that we'll have to go and join him and in fact we will. As I'll mention later you're going to get your first free flight to the Holy Land. <laughs> but he's coming back to a specific place in his body and we shall meet him at that place and that place is Jerusalem. That's the place where everything happened that has enabled us to be here this morning. Well now the second question, how is he coming back? 
And here I want to draw, first of all, a tremendous contrast with his first coming. When he came the first time, hardly anybody knew. In fact, for the first nine months he was on earth, only two people knew. And when he was actually born, only a handful of shepherds and a few clever men from the east knew about it. In fact, the whole thing passed unnoticed. His first coming never got into the press of those days. Nobody took any notice. And in fact, the sign in the sky of his first coming was again hardly noticed except by those who were looking hard and studying such things. It was a tiny pinpoint of light that uh, pointed to where he was born. But most people never even noticed that star. In fact, some people have tried to persuade me that the wise men following the star means that astrology is in the Bible and approved. I want to tell you nothing could be further from the truth. The basic belief of astrology is that the position of the stars affects a baby when it is born. But at Bethlehem, it was the position of the baby that was affecting the stars. And that's rather different. In fact, it's completely the opposite. But it was just a tiny pinprick of light that signaled his first coming. We're told that the second coming, the entire sky will be lit up like lightning from east to west. And the whole sky will blaze and everybody will know something of unique significance has happened. So the first coming was so quiet, so unnoticed, so humble, the second coming will be in total contrast to that. In fact, I want to give you a little Greek lesson for three minutes. There are three Greek words that are used in the New Testament about his second coming, which were not used about the first, and each of which is very significant, and here they are. The first is a word, parousia, which means an arrival, an important arrival. It was used in the ancient world of the arrival of a royal personage, the king or queen coming to visit. It was also used of an invading army. When D-Day arrived, it was a parousia. Something was going to happen that would change the whole situation. So that's the first word. It is an arrival of tremendous significance. Second Greek word I want to pass on to you is epiphania, which means not to arrive, but to appear. Have you ever been in Pall Mall? stood around the Victoria Monument on a national occasion and looked up at the balcony of the Buckingham Palace, that first floor balcony, and waited for those French doors to be opened by the footman and then the royal family appears on the balcony, the moment that everybody's been waiting for. And a great cry goes up from the crowd of excitement. That's what this second word means. It means to come out into the balcony where everybody can see you, to appear before the people. Now, he didn't do that on his first coming. And then the third word is apocalypsis. And that word means to be uncovered, not to appear naked, but to appear as you really are. And therefore, you will not see a baby lying in a manger on his second coming. He will appear as he really is, the Son of God, with all his glory. D did you see the Queen arriving for the opening of Parliament? Did you see her with her crown and jewels in her glory? She was appearing as she is, the Queen of England. And when Jesus comes back, he will appear as he is. He will be uncovered and people will see his glory. When he came the first time, that glory was covered up. And all the paintings of him with halos round his head are quite inaccurate. He didn't walk around with a halo. In fact, if he did, people would have asked questions. But in fact, they saw no beauty that they should desire him. And to most people, he was simply a carpenter from Nazareth. That glory was hidden. But when he comes the second time, it will not be hidden at all. Everybody will see him. Therefore, there is a very great contrast between his first coming and his second coming. But there is not a contrast between his first going and his second coming. Does that sound a bit Irish to you? Let me explain what I mean. Supposing you had been 
on the Mount of Olives with a video camera like this on the day that Jesus ascended into heaven, went back home to be with his father. And supposing you'd been able to take a video of him ascending until he disappeared up there into the clouds, supposing that you had that video, and supposing you could then play it backwards, you would have an exact film of his second coming because the angels at his ascension said to the men who were gazing up into heaven, why do you go on gazing up into heaven? He will come back in exactly the same way as you saw him go. So that whereas his second coming is a complete contrast to his first coming, it is exactly the same as his first going, except that it will be in reverse and he will appear out of the clouds. By the way, that means that it will be a west wind at the time. The wind will be westerly. Do you know why I'm able to say that? Because in Israel, they only get clouds if the wind is from the west. When it comes from any other direction, it comes from the desert, and it's a dry, hot wind. But when it comes from the Mediterranean, it picks up moisture, and you can see a little cloud forming that's no bigger than a man's hand, and that'll get bigger and bigger, and finally you'll get rain. So we know the wind will be from the west. Once again, I mention this. I want you to realize we're talking about reality, not talking about something in a stained glass window or a fairy tale. We're talking about something that will actually happen in this world of ours with the wind blowing from the west and those cumulus clouds. I love flying above clouds, don't you? Looking down on the sunlit clouds from above, that's the nearest thing you'll see in physical terms to the Shekinah glory of God because always you find clouds associated with the glory of the Lord and I'm sure cumulus clouds are the nearest to that glory, the way they mount up like a mountain range with the sun shining on them. So that's how he will come and uh, I've told you what you can see but I better tell you what you will hear. If you don't like noisy meetings then you better not be around on that occasion it will be the noisiest meeting that's ever been held, as well as the biggest. My grandfather is buried in Newcastle on Tyne, and on his gravestone, he was a pastor by the way, and on his gravestone are three words, not rest in peace. And the three words are not from the Bible, they're from the hymn book, they're from an old Methodist hymn. And these are the three words, what a meeting! And uh, I think people must stand and look at that gravestone and wonder, what on earth is he talking about? Well, now, Christians sometimes get meeting-itis and we get fed up with meetings, but what a meeting that will be! The biggest, there won't be a stadium on earth to hold it, so we're going to have to hold it in the air. That's when you get your free flight to the Holy Land. But the noise, there'll be archangels shouting their heads off, there'll be trumpets blowing, enough noise to raise the dead and in fact it will. <laughs> and here's a lovely thought, don't worry about dying before this happens because if you die before it happens you get a front seat. <laughs> That's what my Bible says. Paul says to the Thessalonians, don't grieve about those who've already died, they're not going to miss anything, far from it. When he descends from heaven with the sound of a trumpet, the dead will rise first. So that means they get there first and then we who are alive catch up with them. So Paul says encourage each other with these words, cheer up, if you die first you get a front seat, so we win either way. If we don't die first we get a new body straight away and no undertaker measures us up, so it's good news either way. Well now that's how he's going to appear and the, there will be millions upon millions. There are now 1500 million people who profess to believe in Jesus. So that really will be a big meeting. To say nothing of all the angels, and there are myriads of them, and they'll be joining in too. I can't imagine what the singing is going to be like. Now, when will he come? And here we run into problems, and Christians are very good at trying to guess dates. I just jotted down a few of the dates that leading Christians have mentioned. There was a man called Miller and he said it would be 1843. 
By the way, if you're going to guess the date of the second coming, my advice is guess a date well after you will be here. <laughs> because then you won't have to be around to face the music. It's much wiser to think of one well ahead rather than one in the immediate future. But Miller said it was 1843, and from that prediction has come the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Then there was a man called Russell, and he said it would be 1914. And from him came the Jehovah's Witness movement. But lest you think that it's only cults or sects that guess the date of the Second Coming, let me tell you that Martin Luther said it was 1636. Now that was wise because he certainly would be dead by then. John Wesley was equally wise. He said 1874. And most Christians love to try and work it out and get the little programs and get the details together. And in our day, there have been a lot of people saying, we are the last generation. Have you heard this one? A lot of people have asked me, do you think it will be in our lifetime? Well, I hope it will be in my lifetime because that would mean no funeral and no funeral director being called in to deal with my corpse. That would excite me very much. I hope so. Every generation hopes so. But Jesus himself said, of that day or of that hour knows no one, not even the Son. The Father only keeps that date. So it's a good thing to be very cautious when somebody tells you, I know the date. Mind you, I'm going to tell you in a moment that I think I know the month, <laughs> but I don't know the year. I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, if Jesus himself was ignorant of the date, are we likely to know it? Nevertheless, his disciples did ask him, Jesus, what will be the signs of your coming, the signals of your coming? How will we know when it's going to happen? And Jesus actually gave them signals. He gave them signs. He said, now, you're to watch and pray. Now, what are we to watch for? You can't watch for his coming, otherwise you'd have to walk around like that all day, looking at the sky. He didn't mean watch for his coming. He said, watch for the signs of my coming. And he told us exactly what they were. Now, many, many years ago, I used to uh, go and look at trains. I still do, actually. But um, as a boy, I used to love to be a train spotter. And in those days, it was the LNER, the London and Northeastern Railway that ran through my home city of Newcastle on Tyne. And what you may not know is that just outside the Newcastle Central Station is the biggest railway crossing in the whole world. And uh, there's a picture of it. And I used to go and stand at the end of the platform there, overlooking that biggest crossing where all the lines from London and the south cross with all the lines from Scotland and the north. And it's by far the best place to go train spotting in the entire country. And we learned early to watch for the signals that would tell us when the train was coming. And there were four signals you watched for. In those days, the signals weren't electric light bulbs. They were a big arm that went down and up again. Do you remember those? Some of you do. And there was the distance signal, which was a yellow one with black stripes on with a kind of fork in the end. That was the distance signal. That was the furthest out. Then there was the outer home signal, a red one then the inner home, and finally there was what was called the starter signal, which was right at the platform and actually cleared the train to start from the platform. So it was saying the next bit of line is open. And we used to watch these signals, four of them. And when the distance went down, you knew the train was a few miles away. The outer home went down when the train was in the section. The inner home, you got really excited because you knew it was round the bend. And by the time the starter went down, there it was. And you could tell how near the train was. Now, Jesus gave his followers four signals, four signs, and they are very, very clear. And he says, these are the signals to watch for. He said, the first, 
you will see in the world out there. So watch the world for the first signal. The second will be in the church. So watch the church for the second signal. The third will be in the Middle East. So watch the Middle East for the third signal. And the fourth will be in the sky. And you'll see that signal in the sky. Now Christians get into such a muddle about all these signs, but I've taken these four signs straight from Jesus. My principle is to, to start with what Jesus said and fit everything else in the Bible into what he said. And he gave us this very simple framework into which you can fit all the other details. Now the first signal is in the world and consists of disasters. Three in particular Jesus mentioned, earthquakes, wars, famines. He said you're going to see more and more of those and I'm afraid we are doing. Did you know that uh, earthquakes are doubling every 10 years? It's not just that we hear about them now, there are more taking place. And I was earlier this year in the Philippines in the city of Baguio. I'd never heard they'd had such a bad earthquake, but I stood and looked at the appalling ruin of the Hyatt International Hotel, 15 stories, and it had just collapsed like that. And they were spraying disinfectant with a hose pipe on the ruins because they couldn't get any of the bodies out. And all the American and Japanese tourists were buried under it. Streets opened and great cracks. I've never actually been in an earthquake like that, so I, I can't imagine what it must be like. And famines, there's plenty of that around and increasing. And wars, I didn't realize there have been 36 international conflicts since World War II. And I keep talking about that as the last war, but it wasn't. 36, and that's to say nothing of the civil wars that are now going on. And Jesus said, when you hear all these things, that's sign number one. And he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Because he said, that's not the end, but the beginning. He said, it's not death pangs, but birth pangs. It's painful, but it's the pain of contractions of a new universe coming. Now that puts a whole different light on it. It doesn't mean that Christians are callous or unsympathetic to the victims of these disasters. But we don't say, I don't know what things are coming to. We say, I do know what things are coming to. There's a good line for you if you want to witness. When anybody says, I don't know what the world's coming to, just quietly say, I do, and see what happens. You'll get a good opening. But you see, Jesus says, these are like the first contractions an expectant mother feels. They're the beginning of something, not the end of something. They're not signs of the end, they're signs of the beginning. Something's going to be born out of all this pain, out of all this travail. Something's going to be born. This is the universe laboring. Paul actually talks about the whole creation groaning and traveling. And you can hear earthquakes. They groan, they travel. So earthquakes are natural disasters. Wars are human-caused disasters. And famines can be a bit of both. But Jesus said that's the beginning of the end. But it's a beginning that follows. So don't let your hearts be troubled. But he said, I want to warn you that when all these disasters are filling the world, that gives a unique opportunity for false messiahs to arise, for false Christs. And we are getting a whole lot of them. Why, we've just had one of our national footballers claiming to be the Son of God coming into the world. And I was reading yet again just last week in a weekend magazine of a man who says, I am Yahweh and I have come to save the world. They're popping up all over the place. You see, when the world is shaking with disaster after disaster, people are looking for someone to help them out of their trouble. They're looking for somebody they can trust and look to, a strong man, and that gives a unique opportunity to false Christs. And we can expect a growing number of such false messiahs to appear in our day because of all the disasters that are coming. Now that's sign number one, and that's the danger that accompanies sign number one, the danger of false Christ. But it's highly unlikely 
that Christians will be fooled by false Christs. I had a letter from someone some months ago, which I've mentioned on another video, uh, and this person from Staffordshire wrote to me and he said, Dear David, I have bought one of your tapes thinking that you were a gospel singer. <laughs> but I was disappointed to find that there was no music, only talk. But he said, I have listened to the tape and he said, uh, I am the one you were talking about. I am the Christ. I have come to save the world. And he spent 14 pages telling me this. Good grammar, excellent handwriting. We're going to see an awful lot of this. As disasters shape people, it provides a spiritual vacuum into which false messiahs can step. Now signal number two. Signal number two is in the church and consists of three features. Just as the first signal consisted of three features, three kinds of disaster, earthquake, war and famine, so the second signal has three parts to it, but this time they all appear in the church. Number one, universal persecution. The church hated by all the nations, everywhere, the church under pressure. Now that has never actually happened in the last 2,000 years, but it is nearer to happening now than it's ever been. Out of some, what, 130, 140 nation states in our world, there are less than two dozen where the church is not under pressure. And the number is getting smaller. And in fact, the first signs of pressure on Christians are appearing here in England, Christian England. And the pressure is really going to be on us, notably at the moment in the education sphere, but the Sex Discrimination Act and the Race Discrimination Act are going to be used against Christians. So the pressure is going to be on us here. Jesus said the first part of this second signal will be universal pressure on the church. And the second part of that sign follows from the first. He said, the love of many will grow cold. In other words, pressure sorts out the nominal Christians from the genuine ones. Those who are Sunday Christians or churchgoers will soon disappear under pressure. I heard of a prayer meeting many years ago in one of the countries behind the Iron Curtain and two soldiers burst into the prayer meeting and they said, we're going to kill the Christians. And they had two Kalashnikov machine guns. And they said, we're going to kill the Christians. And the Christians thought they were drunk, but they were, they were sober. And then they said, if you're not a Christian, get out. And a number got up and ran. And then the two soldiers said to the rest, now will you please tell us how to become Christians? <laughs> they said, we had to make sure of you before we talked to you. Well, how would that affect your church prayer meeting? <laughs> See? Jesus said there will be universal pressure and the result will be a falling away of nominal Christians. Now that's not bad news. That's good news. Because the third part of the sig signal is this. And, said Jesus, the gospel will be preached to all the nations. In other words, when the pressure is on the church, it sorts the church out and refines the church and the church is then far better able to get on with the job that Jesus left us to do, namely to evangelize the nations. And that you can see happening. You can see it happening in China today. There are villages in China where 85% of the population have been born again because the church is under pressure. And that gets rid of nominal churchgoers who can't do the job anyway and the refined church under pressure grows very fast. Don't ever pity churches that are being persecuted. Envy them. Envy them. I remember going to Czechoslovakia years ago and we told them we prayed for them in England and they said, you pray for us? Why? They said, we hold prayer meetings for the church in England because you're in a far more needy state than we are. That put us in our place and humbled us. So that's the second signal to look for. Pressure on the church in every country of the world. Nominal Christians falling away and the rest 
preaching the gospel to all the nations and getting the job done. That's signal number two. Signal number three, he said, will be in the Middle East. And here Jesus quoted from the prophet Daniel an extraordinary phrase which Daniel uses three times in his predictions about the future. And that phrase is the abomination of desolation. That's an inadequate translation. I'm afraid we haven't words bad enough in English really to communicate the horror of that Hebrew phrase. It means something so disgusting, so abhorrent, uh, so offensive. In a sense, it came true before Jesus came. It came true when a man called Antiochus Epiphanes, a Greek emperor, strode into Jerusalem at the head of an army and did the most unspeakable things. He went into the temple at Jerusalem and he sacrificed a pig on the altar, pork on the altar. And then he turned the little vestries, the rooms around the side of the temple into prostitutes' brothels. And that's what happened. It was the most disgusting, blasphemous act that has ever happened in Jewish history. And they have referred to Antiochus Epiphanes as the abomination of desolation. And in a sense he was, or was a foretaste of that. But towards the end of history, we shall see a man described by Paul in 1 Thessalon uh, sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 as the man of lawlessness, a man who says, I acknowledge no law but my own will, a man who sets himself up as God and in the very place where God's name has been placed. Watch the Middle East for that man to appear, for that dreadful thing to happen again. A man defying God in the very place where God's name was holy. And Jesus says those who are living in that area around Jerusalem, as soon as that man appears, get out, go as quickly as you can. Don't stop to pack, just get out and flee quickly. But the rest of you in the rest of the world, he says, stay put, stay right where you are, don't move. And above all, said Jesus, trust your eyes, not your ears. You'll hear rumors that I've come here, I've come there. Don't listen to rumors, don't let your ears, don't let anything you hear mislead you. You just keep watching for me. Now, by the way, in the second signal in the church, I should have mentioned that the danger when that second signal appears will be the danger of false prophets. And I'm afraid Christians are peculiarly prone to believe false prophets. They're not prone to false messiahs, but false prophets in the church. And we know what false prophets say. They always say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They always say, don't worry, it may never happen. They always want to calm and comfort people. True prophets tell the truth, even if it hurts. So we have signal number one in the world, disasters out there in the world, and the danger of false messiahs followed by the world. Signal number two in the church. Pressure on the universal church. Nominal Christians falling away and the rest getting the job done of preaching the gospel. And the danger will be false prophets who will tell the church not to worry, that it's all right, it's not going to get any worse. In the third signal, the danger, said Jesus, will be false messiahs and false prophets. Boy, what a crisis that will bring to us. We'll really have to be very sure of our faith then. And we must not listen. I'm afraid Christians are pretty good gossips, aren't we? Have you heard the latest? Have you heard? Have you heard? Jesus said, listen, use your eyes, not your ears. Watch. He said, there'll be plenty of false prophets telling you what God is saying. There'll be plenty of false messiahs saying, I'm the Christ. Because he said, wherever there's a dead body, the vultures gather. And they're vultures. And they're just picking stuff for themselves out of the mess. Now, at the third signal, I want you to notice two things. First, I want you to notice that Christ has not come yet. Christ has not come yet. You may hear that he's come, but Christ says, don't pay any attention. Christ has not come. And the second thing I want you to notice carefully, and that this is quite far-reaching, the Christians have not gone yet. 
I put those two things together. Here we've got this major crisis in the Middle East, this man of lawlessness, otherwise known as Antichrist, all kinds of things. We have this third signal in the political situation in the Middle East, and isn't that entirely credible now? But Christ has not come yet, and Christians have not gone yet. And so we come to the fourth and last signal. And the fourth and last signal is in the sky. And this is what the signal will be. The sun will be switched off. The moon will be switched off. The stars will be switched off one by one until the entire sky is totally black and there is no natural light whatsoever. Now, this false signal gets me excited. I remember as a little boy being taken to a theatre to see a Christmas pantomime. I recall it vividly. It was the Theatre Royal in Newcastle on Tyne. And uh, I remember sitting there in the balcony and looking at the stage. There was a hubbub of excitement. Everybody was chattering. Lots of children there and families for the Christmas panto. And then one by one, the house lights went out until we were sitting in darkness. And I, I can remember now my little heart beating. It's about to start. It's just about. And we were, silence fell. And then the stage curtains went aside and there was a blaze of light and it all happened. Now that's exactly what the fourth signal will be. God will switch every other light out so that the glory of Jesus will be the only light, like lightning from east to west, from horizon to horizon. There will be just one blaze of light, but it won't be from the sun, the moon or the stars. Now I told you what the danger was when the other three signals appeared. Danger of the first, false prophets, danger, false messiahs, danger of the second, false prophets, danger of the third, false prophets and messiahs. What will be the danger of the fourth signal? Nothing. Be over too quickly. <laughs> so when you get that signal, hold on to your hat because you're off. Uh, you will hear something, you'll hear that trumpet. You'll hear a great trumpet blast. So when you see all the lights go out and see this flash of lightning from one horizon to another and you hear that blast of a trumpet that'll echo around the globe, you hang on <laughs> because you're going to meet him and you will. Now that's the answer to when he'll come except for one little thing. I did say I th thought I knew the month because you see Jesus did everything according to God's calendar. And on God's calendar there are three great times of the year. There is Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. And Jesus died at the Passover and he sent his spirit at Pentecost but he hasn't yet fulfilled Tabernacles. Mind you, if you study your Bible carefully and we haven't time to go into it now, you will find that Jesus was born during that Feast of Tabernacles, late September early October. And the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, says John. But if you work it out, that's when he was born. You knew he wasn't born in December, didn't you? Well, he was born the end of September, beginning of October. But I believe his second coming will be right on time. Not least because the Feast of Tabernacles is preceded by the Feast of Trumpets. And every mention of trumpets in the New Testament is to announce the return of the Lord Jesus. So one of these years, September, October, he'll be back. But I can't tell you which year. Well, we'll take a break now and then we're moving on to the more important questions. Why is he coming back and what difference does that make to the way we live?